Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for a keynote session on the Virtual Island Summit. Um, I know that this time zone um, is tricky for some of you, but I can see um, some of the loyal attendees uh, who've been attending lots of sessions. Uh, Izumi and Prakash, thank you for joining. Prakash, I think you're in Mauritius and you've joined a lot of these sessions, so it's nice to see. Um, we've got a slightly different session now. We had some great panel discussions yesterday on some sustainability topics, um, but today we have um, a very interesting author and I guess you could say explorer who's going to tell us about um, the, the, her, her recent book and um, the, the journeys that she made behind that. I think it's also very relevant for people in the tourism sector, thinking about how their branding and um, and attracting visitors to the island as well. So I think there'll be some interesting um, interesting ideas coming out of this. Just while we're um, getting started, we'll do a quick poll. Interested to see who's joining us at this early time. Um, so quickly enter that in the poll. Um, a reminder that we have a chat function and a Q&A function. In the chat function, make sure when you send a message, you send to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see it. Uh, good morning, Ian Mayburn. Thank you for posting in there already. And then also feel free to send in your questions throughout the session um, because at the end of Lisa's talk, we'll have time for a quick Q&A to discuss those. So can see that we've got people from the Pacific Islands, from mostly from Europe and also from East Asia joining us. So thank you everyone for that. And then just quickly another poll to see um, what type of backgrounds and sector the people who are joining are from, if you want to um, answer that as well. But please also go, and, go ahead and say hello in the chat and introduce yourselves. Feel free to share a bit about what it is that you do and why you're joining the virtual virtual island summit today. We've got a whole uh, we've got a whole range of different talks happening today. Okay, so we see Bruni Island, Australia. Thanks for joining. I know there's not that many sessions in Australia that that work for you all, so I appreciate you you joining. So with that, I'm going to introduce. Lisa Drew from Island Earring. Uh, she is the author of a book of the same title as this session, Island Earring Adventures Around the Edge of Britain's Hidden Islands. Um, she's also kindly donated a copy of that book into our giveaway. So if you're interested in the book, don't forget to enter the giveaway, islandinnovation.co slash giveaway to win a copy. Um, and Lisa has got a very interesting career. I won't go into everything else that she's done, um, but to mention that she's also the chair of the trustees for whale and dolphin conservation. So that's very relevant. And I'm sure she's happy to answer any questions about that at the end. And 10% of the profits of her book uh, go into that charity um, generously. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Lisa and uh, let her take it away with her talk about Britain's Hidden Islands. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us. Thank you, James, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. I know it's not, um, not a great time for some of you, um, but I do appreciate you joining. Um, a massive thank you to James for inviting me to speak at this conference. Um, it's a great honour to be here, and congratulations to you, James, on bringing such a great conference together. Um, so I've um, walked, swam, kayaked and biked around 170 of the islands um, of the British Isles and I've written a book recently about 50 of them. Um, I'm going to share with you how this project evolved and some of the stories um, on the way of what I've discovered that may well resonate with um, the themes of this conference. So I'm having... Maybe. So... All of us, particularly at this conference, um, know how special islands are. There's something about them. They're smaller, they're defined places, um, they're surrounded by the ocean. Um, for me, they're a great way to escape from the harm and complexity of the modern world. Um, and on the islands of the Shars, I feel a real sense, a special kind of freedom. Um, I know that I'm going to experience nature at the Sororist and a culture define my history and a great sense of place. And somehow, every experience I've had on the islands 
always feel more authentic and special in the mainland. And there's this description um, written by uh, Lawrence Durrell in one of his many books. It's called Isla Mania, a rare affliction, but by no means unknown. Sorry, a, a rare, but by no means a affliction of the spirit. There are people who find islands somehow irresistible. The mere knowledge they're on an island, a little world surrounded by the sea, fills them with an indescribable intoxication. And for me, that term describes exactly how I feel. And by that definition, I am an island maniac. So, um, but it's not, it's not just about islands for me. It is, it is about visiting them, but it's actually, it's the outer edge that most fascinates me. Um, and I'm absolutely obsessed about traveling around that outside edge. So it's special because um, this is where the beaches are, the cliff tops, the amazing geological formations. Um, it's also the intertidal zone, the difference between high and low water and the frontier between two worlds. Um, it's where twice a day at low tide, the ocean reveals its secrets and offers a unique window into what life is like beneath the waves. And I think certainly in Britain, it's one of our last great wildernesses. Um, it's on this outer edge that I feel the greatest connection to the ocean and getting around that outside edge is a way for me to completely understand an island because I have um, completed the circuit. So I termed, um, I developed a term for this. I've called it island earring. Um, and really island earring is very simple. It's walking, wading, scrambling, running, cycling, kayaking, or swimming around an island's outer edge. So essentially whatever way you can best get around it. But it is essentially completing the circuit. And for me, I'm also a keen mountaineer. Um, it shares a psychology uh, with mountaineering in that in my whole mountaineering career, I've never met anyone that aims to go halfway up a mountain. It's about completing the mountain, getting to the top, seeing the far horizons. And for me, that's a very similar psychology to island earring. Um, but it's also, it's not just the, the, the getting around the outer island, it's finding the adventure on the way in one of the last great wildernesses of Britain. So where did this all start for me? Some say it's a quite a strange hobby, but where did it all start? Um, it started um, when I was 12, 12. and this, this island that you can see here is a very tiny little island called Asparagus. Um, off the coast of Cornwall, um, off beautiful coast of Kynance Cove. And it was a scene of a family stranding at the age of 12. Um, my parents couldn't think of anything worse, but I couldn't think of anything better than having this whole place to myself to explore with the people I love most and a massive great big picnic camper to sustain us. And I think that was probably the inspiration for another 40 years of travel. So as James mentioned, I've had a sort of an interesting career. Um, I went to university, had a, had a very busy career afterwards. So I was like most people, I had 25 days holiday a year. And actually when I started to go on holiday to explore places, um, when I sat down and analyzed actually where I was going, um, I was finding I was going, everyone was going to India, but I had to get to the Andamans. Um, people were touring to the USA, but I wanted to spend time in Hawaii and Santa Cruz and Hatteras Islands in, in the States. Italy, Aeolian Islands, Malaysia, Sipadan, and, and kind of so it went on really. Um, so I had a bit of an epiphany um, 12 or so years ago when um, I and a group of friends were sea kayaking around the Isles of Scilly. And what I recognised there was that I, had, I saw equal beauty to anywhere else I've been in the world, and here it was right on my doorstep. But I also appreciated actually that getting around that outside edge was a way of completely knowing an island. And so I went home. And I try to map, it's sort of in my mind, how many of those islands can I actually get around the outer edge of? And what I found was a number of things. Firstly, that in the British Isles is 4,400 islands, which is you know, a big project by any standards. Um, and additionally, at high tide, there's a further 6,000 islands. So, um, and also that there's very, very little information about these islands, let alone if you could get around the outer edge. So um, for me, um, being driven by curios curiosity, this completely piqued, um, piqued my curiosity and has kind of um, defined what I've done in the last 12 years um, in my spare time. So in that time, I have gone around the outer edge of 170 islands of the British Isles. I've mountain biked, um, I've road biked, I've swam, I've ran, I've scrambled, sea kayaked, um, any, any means to get around the outside edge. And um, I've clocked routes. Um, here's a sort of example of, this, of the kind of thing I'm doing is it has to be around the outside edge as far as possible, but where you have special areas of wildlife or where you have military zones, obviously you can't do that. So I've just tried to push, um, push the routes as far as I can uh, within the law, mostly. 
Um, and actually, I think I can probably describe my whole experience of those 170 islands in um, the type of the fun scale. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this, but type one fun is um, the sorts of places that most people go on holiday. So lovely, lovely beaches, great local food. Um, type two fun. Type two fun is the sort of fun that when you're doing it, you think, I'm not really sure why I'm doing this because I'm soaking wet or the terrain is really rough or I've lost or I've just got stranded on an island. Um, but actually when you get back to the cafe or have a beer at the end of the set, end of that, that trip, you think, do you know what, that was such good fun. I really want to do that again. And then type three fun. Um, this is actually my mountain bike helmet um, after quite a serious crash. <clears throat> um, that island wasn't really suitable for mountain biking. And also a, a, a whole number of um, swims that I didn't intend to take getting back from islands um, that the sea crossings were probably a bit too, too rough. Um, and I, sh I maybe shouldn't have attempted them. But you'll be pleased to know that in the book of 50 islands, um, I've actually only chosen the type one and type two funds. Um, I've learned a lot of things on, uh, on this um, trip or this, um, yeah, this project. So the first one is that not all low tides are equal. And it took me actually rather a long time to realise this. <clears throat> so in the UK, there's parts of it that have the second highest tidal range in the world. So the difference between high and low water is about 15 metres, which adds a whole new challenge to try and get around some of these islands. But quite what I hadn't clocked was that the difference between low tide um, could be up to uh, 3.5 metres. So when there's a registered low tide, it can be a low tide that's 3.5 metres higher than the low tide of the previous day. Um, and being 1.6 metres tall myself, um, that makes a big difference between a nice little walk back across, <coughs> across the beach or a swim, or actually, if it's really bad, a stranding. And what I have learned from the project is that stranding is perfectly okay. Um, and I'm at peace with that if and when it happens. Um, the other key learning, it's very hard to decide, decipher what that might be from this, but um, it's about seasickness. Uh, what I discovered about myself is that I do get incredibly seasick, even with the slightest movement of water, which may to some make this project seem even more of a crazy thing for me to do. Um, but nonetheless, I, ha I have continued. And what's fascinated me is on my travels, um, how many people have given me remedies for seasickness. Um, and this is one of my favourites. Um, after travelling to the Isles of Scilly in the west on the west coast of Cornwall, um, even the pets that were being taken over the ferry were ill. And when I described this to um, <coughs> a local, he said, well, on the way back, if you go to the Mermaid Tavern and all of the luggage is outside, and bearing in mind this is uh, sort of eight o'clock in the morning, um, it means that all the locals in there know that it's going to be a, a rough crossing and they're having a couple of pints of beer or cider to, to help them on their way. Now, I have experimented with that seasickness remedy and I'm not sure whether it works or whether I don't care that I'm seasick anymore because I'm generally in a happier place, but I'd be really interested from around the world um, what people use for their seasickness cures. The third thing I learned, and I think this is the major thing, is what an incredibly diverse set of islands we have right here in the British Isles. So um, places of sanctuary, religion, places of war, isolation hospitals or where we've imprisoned offenders to keep them away from mainstream populations. Who owns them today has a massive impact on the nature of the, <coughs> of the islands. So some are completely private, particularly in the south, and there's absolutely no access. Others are owned by wildlife trusts or military and local government. Um, the inhabited islands have very distinct cultures, traditions, and, uh, and plenty of innovation, as you've been hearing at the conference. And the uninhabited islands generally sh showcase nature in all of its glory. I've never, I never would have anticipated um, the, the fecund nature of some of our islands, and it's almost like being in straight direct into a David, David Attenborough show. Um, there are several thousand islands of British Isles, um, and I can honestly say that no two are even remotely the same even if they're right next to each other. So the next part of the talk is really just to take you on a whistle stop tour and just explain some of the things that I've sort of seen and experienced on the way that may well resonate with many of you at the conference. Um, the first are the Isles of Scilly, so uh, right off the west coast of Cornwall. Um, there's five inhabited islands, but there's 140 islands and islets in all. It's a very, very popular destination, and I would say almost a perfect holiday destination. Um, there's lots of events that happen there. The sporting events, there's a World Gig, uh, gig Championship and the gig is um, it's this, it's the, the local boat. Um, 
there's uh, festivals for food, wildlife, walking, music, um, there's swim challenges between the islands. So they really are using their um, local sort of heritage um, to make the most of tourism in these islands. <coughs> for me, every one of these islands um, that I inhabited have a beautiful coastal walk. So this was easy for me. I just had to follow the, follow the map on this one. I didn't have to decide to cycle my own route. Um, each island is a very distinct character, with, um, particularly with local food, and they really go to town about celebrating. So, St. Martin's, you have a bakery, there's vineyard, there's local fish and chips, where even the potatoes for the chips are grown in the field beyond. <coughs> My favourite pub, which is the Seven Stones. Um, in Briar, you have the Tatty Cake, uh, Fudge Crab Shack in Hell Bay, and in St. Agnes, there was a real need to diversify after foot and mouth disease in the smallest dairy herd in the UK and I produce some of the most diversely flavoured ice creams you could ever imagine, and it's, I can guarantee it's delicious. Um, the adventure for me on these islands come from um, rising sea levels, <laughs> uh, in that, the, that in, at the Bronze Age times, these islands were actually one big plateau, um, and rising sea levels have actually um, delineated the islands that we see today. But it means that the sea between the islands is very, very shallow. So at extremely low tide events, which happen two or three times a year, you can actually walk, um, walk on the ocean floor and you can meet islanders in the middle from the other island. And because Scilly does this in a great way, you know, with tourism, they, I think they really have it nailed, sustainable tourism as well. Um, they, you can have, uh, they have pop-up champagne and seafood um, shacks in the middle um, where you can chat to the people that have got to the same place from the other islands. So moving around, um, a little down to the um, we're going to the um, archipelago down here which is the Channel Islands. Um, the Channel Islands are again an incredibly diverse set of islands. Eight inhabited, I've got four in the book. So Ordonnay, um, which is just off the French coast and it's the hardest to get to um, and as such it's retained a lot of its unique character. Um, as an outlier it has a very very strong community that describe themselves as a thousand alcoholics clinging to a rock. And believe me, these guys know how to party. Um, the wildlife is extremely spirited. Um, there's a massive gannet, gannet colony, which is these rocks here that I'm showing you. Um, lots of puffins. And it also has, um, uh, it's called a blonde hedgehog, which is unique to this island. And I was un unaware of this hedgehog until I was camping one night as I was um, looking at the trails around there. And I had this horrendous noise in the tent, which um, scared the living daylights out of me. And when I actually shone my torch on it, there's this um, ghostly figure with black eyes looking at me. And, and that's how I met uh, the local hedgehog. Um, there's hundreds of them. And when I actually started to walk around at night, there's just thousands of them. And, but they're unique to this island, as many, much of the wildlife is. Um, Sark is actually a time walk. walk. It's self-governed. Um, it can control its outside influences and the pace of any change. There are no cars on the island. This is the general way that tourists get around. Um, it promotes itself as a dark skies reserve and it is absolutely wonderful to spend the night there and just see the galaxies in their full glory and the stars. And the locals draw their curtains and turn off their lights off at night so that people, people's experience of that isn't, isn't spoiled. There's no light pollution fabulous coastal path and they're developing their, um, there's some great adventure to be had there um, and they're de definitely developing that uh, as an offer. And then Herm, you have the island of Herm, which is the classic seaside getaway from Guernsey. Um, you know, it's got a beach like Paul Sports Cafe, completely different to the other islands um, and free sips and beer. And the aim of the owner is, just, is to balance the influx of vis visitors without losing its um, natural and cultural heritage. So one of the biggest um, surprises to me were the islands of um, the south in the southeast. So this is our most populated corner of the UK. And it's surprising in that it, these islands are an incredible haven for wildlife and people alike. Um, so starting with Canby, uh, it's much maligned in the UK, Canby Island. There's lots of jokes about it. It sits in the Thames Estuary and is generally um, an industrial island. Um, so it has a massive industrial heritage. It's where it was a designated port to import gas before the discovery of our own gas in um, our energy in the North Sea. And there's a massive in infrastructure that was built to receive the first shipments of um, natural gas from the US. Um, obviously that became redundant very quickly with the discoveries in the North Sea and <clears throat> this pipe work and vast storage areas have just been left to rot. And incredibly, it's now nature has taken over and it's now the one of the most biodiverse spots in Europe for insects. 
Um, this is a little carver bee, uh, which is incredibly rare in other places. So it says, sings to me about the resilience of nature and it can recover if it's allowed to. Um, the other island which is absolutely fascinating is Foulness. Um, these are incredibly wild sands. I mean, it's just wildlife you see there and you know, a couple of crazy people like me. Um, but it's right next to the really busy town of South End on Sea. But you wouldn't believe it by looking at this. And I certainly didn't see the influence of uh, such a populated area. It's a treacherous route along the vast sands of its coast, officially called the Broomway, but now known as the Doomway because so many people have lost their lives becoming disoriented in this. And it's hard to believe that this is just literally away from a hugely populated area. Um, but, but most interestingly, at the northern tip of the island is a small community and they live in these quaint weatherboard houses they have done for hundreds of years and they have their own dialect and they have words like stringies, cadgers and doggies to describe different fish, um, uh, you know, various other things. And I found it quite hard to understand what they were talking about. Um, and it's incredible that this, they're surrounded by a massive population which is otherwise not affected them. And then Mersey Island, um, a massive foodie destination for seafood. Um, and uh, very, very famous now for its native oysters. Um, and most importantly, it's probably one of the greatest rewilding projects that we currently have in the UK, um, where the native oysters are being restored. Um, there's a coalition of scientists, conservation fishermen working together to restore the UK's largest protected area for native oysters, which has, as ecosystem engineers, um, uh, they have a massive additional benefit other than um, simply the economic, obvious economic ones for the island. So whizzing up the East Coast, uh, we don't have so many islands on the East Coast, but the ones we have are great. I just don't have time to sort of talk about them here too much. Um, we go to Orkney, and I think you've already had presentations from Orkney about, about Orkney and its energy story. Um, it's a wonderful archipelago, one of my favourites. I'm included four islands in the book, but I have circumnavigated all of them. And, you know, there's a, a number of things these islands have in common. The first is the wind. It's incessant, persistent, strong. Um, if I've spent a number of weeks up there, I come back almost um, walking at an angle because I've been so used to sort of walking into the headwind. Um, you can't put anything down without tying it down. Um, I, I was perplexed when I first got there about why there were fishing nets thrown over dustbins until I realised that if there wasn't, then the dustbins would just sort of disappear and be blown across to the next island. Um, but the obvious advantage of that is the wind power. And I have my favourite wind turbine in the whole of the UK on an island called Flotter. And Interestingly, it overlooks uh, a very large oil refinery um, and at night I often navigated my way around the islands and located myself, orientated myself by the red light on the wind turbine and the orange um, flare of the stack of the oil refinery. So using sort of old and new uh, energy technology to navigate. Um, the other thing about the islands of, of Orkney that really um, strikes me is the people. Um, then the most open armed of any islanders. The community is really, really strong and retain very much uh, a lot of their character. Um, people make, work really hard to make these communities thrive because it's not easy living in Orkney. And many people have several jobs. So this is a guy called Billy Muir um, and he was the old lighthouse keeper. He now has several jobs. He um, is the lighthouse tour guide. He's a mechanic, church warden, air traffic controller, sheep farmer, just to name a few of the jobs he does. But it, people have to do that on these islands to keep the communities alive. My favourite tradition on Orkney is that of the seaweed eating sheep. So these guys are kept onto the beach side, they eat sheep, they eat seaweed only, if they ate grass they would die. Um, they are massively valuable to the economy of this island, um, which otherwise wouldn't have a lot of income. Um, even the Queen had um, this lamb on her, um, one of her big royal birthdays. So um, really important, but it's an aging population on the island. Uh, they've really struggled to att attract incomers. Um, so um, actually to keep this wall, which is a really substantial wall and is 18 kilometers long, and it's the root of my, in my book, um, but to keep that maintained, which they have to do after the winter storms is too difficult, too hard for an aging population. So what uh, they've done on the islands is they have an annual sheep festival where people from all over the world come and volunteer and they maintain that wall. And I have spent a couple of days at that festival and it's an incredible place to meet people from all over the world and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, moving around to the Outer Hebrides, um, it's a string of islands connected by road, very in the outer, it's on the outermost edge of Britain. Um, each island has a complete, um, completely different identity 
um, and it's some of the best opportunities for spotting some really iconic wildlife, UK wildlife, and the most incredible beaches. So, um, Great Banara, um, it's the scene here. Um, this is the tidal bell here. It's a lovely art project. Um, it's one of many installed on beaches around the UK to celebrate the connections between different parts of the country, um, the land and the sea between people and their environment. And it's beautiful to stand on the beach and hear its different ringtones of different states of the tide. Just behind this, um, on the walk around the island, is a riotous stone which commemorated the crofters that triggered the land reforms of Scotland. Uh, which led to farmers being permitted to own their own land. And that fierce community spirit is still very present today at this island, on this island, um, with islanders quite recently threatened to blow up the mainland cliffs uh, if the authorities didn't build them a causeway uh, to improve the transport links to the island, because without that, the island would have actually um, died. Um, you have Eriske, incredibly wild space, um, lots of iconic wildlife that you can see there, um, but of interest, uh, of amusement to, to many, I would imagine. It's, this is the scene where in 1941, this, the, the ship uh, ran aground and locals mounted their unofficial salvage operation and managed to consume and hide 260,000 bottles of whiskey. Um, and it's that story that inspired Whiskey Galore. And the tales and myths of those stories are still being told around the peak fires of that island now. It was only two years ago, the latest kind of rendition of Whiskey Galore was, um, was released. So it's still, very much part of mythology. And then Valley, an incredibly beautiful tidal island um, full of sands that I've never seen anywhere before. Um, and this is sort of while camping on the island, it was, it was an amazing experience. Nobody goes across to this island and perhaps that's the reason that planning permission has been granted to start to extract the sands. And you know, my question would be, would this experience be available to, to like, the next generation? So I'm sorry I'm whizzing through these because so much I could speak about these islands. But uh, So off we're to the Inner Hebrides now. So obviously much closer to population. Um, and that has, <clears throat> that has sort of flavoured and tainted the islands in a very different way. Um, there's a real mix, quite an eclectic mix of religious sites here. So on Oranze you have an Augustinian Pari. So early Christianity and a carved um, Celtic cross here, which was probably originated in Iona, which is an um, iconic site for pilgrims, for religious pilgrims. Um, but what I like about the islands is also a site that's thought to be an island of debauchery. So there's shell middens on the islands, <clears throat> which is the kitchen waste left by any man. Um, and it was seen that this island was the heart and soul of parties thrown by hunter-gatherers feasting on limpets um, and matchmaking and gossiping. <clears throat> and I like to think of what that might have been like at the time. Um, in a similar location you have um, Davar Island and um, here there's a huge painting of crucifixion in a sea cave and it appeared overnight and locals thought it was a sign of God and that their, um, that their fishing would be protected and that they, they felt that they were special and that they, they you know. Um, actually what it, it, it turned out wasn't a sign of from God at all, it was a local teacher um, just went into the cave one night and painted the, this painting. And when he was found out, um, he was actually, he, he had to leave the community. Um, but it's quite an amusing story. Um, literally here, um, sorry, there's a Buddhist island. So you leave the, the mountains and the traditional scenery of Arran, um, off the west coast of Scotland, and you enter a Buddhist island. It's called Holy Island. It's owned by Buddhist monks. So here you can see stupas. Uh, you can see nuns on lifetime retreats. Um, but when you land on the island, you have to agree to abide by the five rules of Buddha. And I don't know if any of you have been to Scotland, but um, at certain times of the year, the midges are absolutely horrendous and you have a real kind of temptation to sort of do this. And one of the rules of Buddha is that you don't kill anything. So I had quite a torturous five to six hours on the island um, trying to find the route without actually trying to swat any of these midges. And then um, you have Eileen Shona, a private island. Um, it's where it's inspired J.M. Barry um, for his screenplay for Peter Pan. And with the moss draped woods, it's easy to see what inspired him. It's now owned by the Branson family and they have a book of feats. So one of the feats is to eat a jellyfish live or another one is to, to um, swim to the local island, which is 11 kilometers away or climb the mountain in fancy dress. So it just, it just has that feel that's a real adventure island. I loved it there. Um, Whizzing around, we're going down the west coast of, of England now. I thought I would just pull this story out. Um, this is a guy called Ray Porter, and he's 
been, uh, he's a Queen's Guide to the Sand. So you can see the tiny island of Chapel Island here. And to get there, you have to walk across um, sinking sands and f tides that are, are faster than a human can run. So I just, I did opt to go with him this time um, to have a safe passage through. And he's a local shrimp and cockle fisherman. And he's been doing that his whole life. And there's nothing he knows about these sands and areas. Nothing that he doesn't know about these sands and areas. But he was telling me stories of um, people coming in from gangs from the big cities and extracting the shellfish um, in a way that meant that their populations never recovered. And what I find interesting about that is they were selling them on to large fish processors um, of big brands who obviously weren't checking the sourcing of some of the raw materials that they were using. Um, but on the way, on a lighter note, when we came back across here, um, you, uh, across the Levens Estuary, he said that he could, I had fish, tall fisherman stories the whole time, and I didn't know when he was joking and when he was being serious. Um, but he told me he could catch flatfish with his feet. Um, and this photo was taken literally just after he managed to catch a flat fish, fish with his feet. I tried it a couple of times, and I, I mean, I think you probably have to have had um, a lifetime of living the way he did to, to do it properly. So on to Wales. Um, Wales has a hundred islands or so. Um, <clears throat> there's only one island in, Wales where, in Wales, sorry, where people live and work, and that's Bardsey Island. And it's run by a trust that are really trying hard to balance farming and nature. Um, there are two other islands quite close to each other. One is Skomer Island, which is this one, and it's famed for Manx Shearwaters. I think it has something like 50% of the world's population nesting there in season, and puffins, and it has a huge number of visitors, um, as this shows. Then right next door, there's an island called Ramsey Island, um, and it's lost its puffins um, due to rats. It's probably one of the most weirdest experiences that I've ever had to do. Um, when I boarded the boat, I had to open all of my bags and demonstrate that I didn't have any rats in my bags to take them over to the islands. So they're trying so hard to get the, um, the puffins back uh, onto the island that they have put decoys up, um, sound recordings and mating puffins. Because actually, if they can bring the puffins back, um, then they can bring the tourists back and they will be economically more viable. But it would seem that puffins have got a very long memory and there's no, they haven't had a result so far. Um, another island that I brought to your attention is Cape Ballast is, um, is probably one of the newest islands in Britain and it's man-made. So this follows the story of when we used to export slate across um, the globe. Um, and it's some of the most prized slate in the world in some very iconic buildings. But it would be transferred from the quarries to um, a port called Port Maddock, and here that it'd be shipped over the world. And when those ships returned, um, if they needed extra ballast, then they would pick up local rocks. Um, and then as soon as they came into Port, Port Maddock, um, they would dump the rocks. Um, and actually over time, um, it built this island. And it's an incredible place to forage because you can see the geology, like world, world geology there. Um, if that's if that interests you, um, if you just after adventure, then right at the end of this island, the most glorious diving and swimming pools that you can imagine. Um, and then just finally on our little whistle top tour, um, the islands of the Bristol Channel. So this is the second where the second biggest tidal range in the world is, and the main route to major cities Bristol and Cardiff. Um, the first one is Lundy Island here. Um, it's owned by the National Trust, but it's run by the Landmark Trust, and it's run as a holiday destination. So beautiful holiday cottages. It's got its own island pub and shop, um, also as a wildlife reserve. Um, it's a site of a really controversial conservation project 15 years ago to eradicate rats, so it caused a lot of disquiet at the time. And brilliantly, this year, um, there was the report that came out that said in the last 15 years, those bird populations have trebled. Um, it's also surrounded by the UK's worst, uh, first marine conservation zone. Um, and sea life here absolutely thrives and it pulls in a whole new sort of set of tourists that are interested in snorkeling and swimming with the seals. So this is one of the seals off Lundy. Um, I was sat up on the cliff top here and it's absolutely hilarious watching uh, the seals chase the divers and they just sort of, they um, like to bite their flippers and if the divers aren't really used to that, um, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of commotion in, in the water which is amusing to watch. Um, and actually, the, the, well, another one that I brought up for the purpose of the conference is Flat Tom. It's very close to Cardiff. It has many diverse inhabitants in the past, but it's now a wildlife, wildlife reserve, and predominantly for these things, these gulls. Um, and it's a really important nesting site for them. And visiting the island a couple of years ago, one thing that really, really struck me, apart from the horrendous noise and smell, was a huge amount of plastic that was being used for nesting material. I tried to work out why there's so much plastic on the island and realized that actually that was the, the material that these birds were using. 
and also huge cheeky bones and other bits that you wouldn't expect to see there because they've been um, looking for food scraps in the bins of the neighbouring seaside towns. So just to, just to finish off um, island earring stats, um, in the book I've covered a thousand kilometres and almost three times the ascent of Everest um, in terms of height gain. Um, there's 38 completely new routes, so these are, have not been charted before. And to fuel my journey, I just, because I like statistics, I'm a scientist by training, um, I usually just use oat cakes because um, when you're in these watery marine environments, the idea of a sandwich or anything more complicated simply doesn't work. So um, I've consumed just, just in this project alone 4.4 kilos of oat cakes, which is 21,000 calories, which is amazing. Um, a few years ago, um, we supported a very good friend of ours um, who wanted to swim the lake, uh, lake Windermere. And he said at the party afterwards, he gave each of us a key ring. And it said, if you're going to do something stupid, always do it with good friends, which kind of really resonates with me in this project. So I've had some amazing friends to share my journey with. I've had otters on that to say that I nearly stepped on this little guy. Um, the bird life has been extraordinary, just in sheer diversity and numbers. And this little chick is a fulmar chick that uh, I came across in the wall of North Ronaldsey. And shortly after I took this photo, he threw this vomit at me. And um, when I went back to the bird observatory where I was staying, they said, the only thing you can do is actually burn your trousers because you'll never remove that. So it looks like an incredibly cute little chick, but it really wasn't. Um, and these are some of the other guys that I've met on my journey, whales, dolphins, basking sharks, all sorts of marine life that you can see either from the boats or from the coast of the islands. Um, it, that's been extraordinary. And then some of the um, endemic species that you see. So this is the little blonde hedgehog um, that scared living daylights and me. Lundy cabbage, Scottish primroses that only sat found on certain islands and scoma voles. So um, not only the amount of wildlife, but just how special that wildlife is and that the islands of the British Isles are an absolute haven for, for wildlife. I couldn't have done any of this without family and friends. Um, my husband has had to rescue me off islands a few times and my family for writing the book. It's something I think this is really good fun, but do you think other people would as well? So they've accompanied me on some journeys and they've given me pretty robust feedback. Um, and also to the brilliant Daniel Start and Tanya Pascoe who um, really converted my journeys and my stories and what was in my head into a, a beautiful book. Um, Actually, uh, I've been really surprised at how people have been inspired by Island Earring. So I woke up on a bank holiday morning to see that I was actually on the BBC News website, uh, one of the main features, um, and various other um, pretty high profile magazines and newspapers and radio stations picked up, picked up on this. So, I, you know, everybody's Island Earring, let's hope so. Um, this is, I'm, I am the chairman, as James said, of a whale and dolphin conservation. Um, it's a global charity that works hard to protect whales and dolphins. Um, I'm immensely proud of being part of this organisation um, and contributing in whatever way I can. Um, I have a huge respect for the people that work here. Um, so 10% of the profits that I make as an author for my book um, goes to support them in, in a little way. So it just remains to say thank you so much for joining us and for listening. Um, and I'm very happy to uh, answer questions. Um, the book has 50 islands, islandeering.com, the website has um, not quite the 170 yet, but you know, there's more islands on there, or you can get in contact with me that way. So many thanks. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that very interesting presentation. Can you see me now? Can you hear me, Lisa? You're on mute now. Let's uh, both be unmuted and we can have a bit of a bit of a conversation. You're still on mute. Okay. There we go. Yeah, you're back. Well, I wanted to say, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Really interesting insight. And, you know, as a fellow um, British person, I think often these islands are something that we really don't um, 
don't a lot, a lot of people don't really know much about some of these some of these islands i mean i um i studied in in orkney which you talked about and that was a fascinating insight into the cultural differences of the scottish islands i mean even within the outer hebrides there's so much cultural differences as you said between those islands so thanks for those really interesting insights and also to mention that i actually uh i actually heard about you because of that bbc article so um that's uh it, it, amazing how much coverage and, and traction you've been you've been able to get i mean the first question which i'm sure you get all the time and is probably uh not not your favorite question but do you have a favorite or do you have any any favorites that that, that come to mind or is that a horrible question to ask you it is a horrible question um because every island <laughs> um, has had something very special and, and i've discovered something but I, I think ultimately my favorite island is probably Taranze, uh in the outer hebrides uh, the experience, That's an uninhabited island. It is an uninhabited island, um, and but the wildlife—it's like walking into a David Attenborough show. Um, it's undisturbed nature, uh, and I think it's probably my journey out there as well because I had an incredible sea kayak journey out there, and um, dolphins came up and visited the kayak. They were playing with the kayak, and you had the fairy turns diving um, for sand eels. So it, it was just a full-on experience and immersion in nature that I'll never forget. And it, am I right in thinking that's also there was a reality TV show there? Is that the right one? Yes, that's that's one. That's the one that sort of shot them over to fame. <laughs> yes. Right, right. That's what I that's what I was thinking of. Fan, fantastic. Well, I learned a lot of interesting things in that. I didn't know about the blonde hedgehogs of of Alderney, um, and and or, or or about Canvey Island actually. So thank you for those for those um, insights. Do you have any plans? Well, have you made any trips to take Island Daring International or you have enough to keep you occupied in, in Britain right now? Um, I think, um, I mean, I can only Island Daring in Britain really in the, in the summer season um, because of the state of the seas, particularly in Ireland and in Scotland. So, yes, I would love to start Island Daring in warmer climes um, in the winter period. Um, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, there's so much out there. I do have a lot to do in the UK, obviously, and the British Isles, but um, there's so much more to see, and I'd love to. Love to, but it's not happened yet. I haven't started yet, no. I mean, I must admit, the book has taken an awful lot of my time, and then, you know, everything afterwards that's yeah, followed. Definitely. So, um, I'm, I, did get, I did get to spend a month in Ireland, um, but I'm really looking forward to getting back out there now. Well, fantastic. So hopefully some of the attendees of the Virtual Island Summit will uh, send you some invites to come and explore explore their islands. I could see in the chat we had people from across uh, the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland joining in, but also Mauritius, Tasmania. Um, drop it in the chat if I missed you. I think that, that covered them. Um, but also if you have any questions, um, that would be fantastic for, for, for Lisa. Um, I, I, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts. I mean, is, if, 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 have you been approached by any kind of island tourism agencies or do you have any thoughts on how islandeering can also be used as a tool on a practical sense for islands trying to market themselves and trying to, um, trying to differentiate themselves from, from others? It seems like there could be a, there could be something useful there. I mean, it's, it's a bit different, but what immediately came to mind was the, the coastal path. And you might know um, what the latest on this is, but I know that within, I think it's just England, maybe Wales too, there was a plan to make the entire coastline, that to have, have a public footpath running across the entire coastline. So islandering on a very big scale. Um, do you know anything about that either? Um, I, it has affected um, some of my planning because um, some of the islands that are, um, some of the islands were included. So where the islands don't currently have a coast path, uh, I have gone around the outer edge myself, but um, there will be an official coast path, so it make it a lot easier for other people to follow the route. Um, there's other islands I was hoping to be included, but they're private islands and um, they're exclusive islands, so they haven't been included. But um, I think it's a, a tremendously exciting project because I think people like to, um, they like to follow a route. Um, they like to complete something. So that could be the outside edge of the island. And everywhere where there is an official coastal path, it's a massive boost for the local economy, bringing in walkers. Um, so other islands have um, 
unofficial coastal path. So Papa Westray, for instance, is a, a brilliant community run island. Well, not community run, but the community spent a lot of time and effort to generate events. Um, so there's an unofficial path on there. Um, but people walk it, people go out just to walk that. Because it's, if you think about why a lot of people visit islands, it's to see the coast, it's to see the cliffs. Um, and it is that outer edge. Um, so where most people experience the wildlife, so the whales and dolphins and the birds, it's that interface between land and sea. So coastal routes are um, the easiest way for people to access that nature, access the beauty. Um, and I don't know with other parts of the world, but in the UK, there's, um, there's a really big growing um, adventure market. So um, co-steering, people want to challenge themselves. So there's lots more, um, Oh, this is where the coastal paths come in. There's a lot more marathons and uh, runs and short, you know, shorter runs. And it, it's just a, the sport is another way of, of bringing people in. Yeah, we're quite lucky in the UK in general in terms of outdoor access. I mean, I think uh, of any country that I've been to, we have the best system of public footpaths in the world. So there's a lot of um, opportunities for people in the UK to have access to land, even though it's private. And that also extends, as far as I know, all beaches in the UK um, are, are public as well. And that's very different than you see in some islands. I mean, Jamaica comes to mind as somewhere that... Unfortunately, a lot of the beaches are privatized and a lot of the hotels um, don't allow local people access to those beaches. And um, obviously those beaches, you know, individually have a much higher value uh, because of the, the climate than they, do, than they do here. And I think that's a, a real tragedy. That varies a lot from uh, between islands and the Caribbean. St. Lucia is an example where at least in theory, if not always in practice, all of the beaches are um, available to the public and hotels, even if it's an all-inclusive hotel that runs the beach, they have to, as I say, in theory, let people um, let people onto the beach, the public people. And I think it's such a shame when um, when people don't have, have access to those. So although I'm sure there are private parts of the UK, it seems like most of the areas you've wanted to visit you've been able to you've been able to access or does it involve some sneaking around and in, in places you shouldn't have been um i think with england um we're fairly i mean there are private places um but i think we're fairly relaxed with scotland obviously you have the uh, the right to roam so even if uh, islands are private you have a right to roam as long as you do that responsibly and for me, I would always go and I would try and contact the owner first and say that I'm doing this. But I, you know, it's within my right to do it. Um, just coming back from Ireland, um, every centimetre of land is privately owned in Ireland. Um, and so it's a bigger challenge to do that. And I think, you know, anyone accessing the outdoors has to be really respectful of what the local landowner wants to do. But I mean, there's certainly places where um, communities have worked together and put footpaths together. And certainly, you know, places like Ireland, there are national groups working together um, to try and make that happen and work with landowners. And I think actually, um, if there's benefit to the landowner and people are responsible, then it can only be, you know, it's a great thing for the local communities. Um, I'm, you know, and also I'm not walking around the outside edge. Uh, I haven't been able to do that in all cases. So I've had to just take the route where access is possible. And certainly writing the book, I've right. been actually been able to include things in that, which, um, you know, is, is legal, obviously. Right. Right. Um, yeah, very interesting. I, that really shocked me the first time I went to the Republic of Ireland. And that was what actually gave me a sense of, of what the public footpaths we have in England, um, of how much I'd taken them for granted. Um, the, the lack of public access to land in Ireland uh, really surprised me. Um, and it's, it's, it's a real shame. Uh, and, and the same in the United States as well. There's, there's, a, there's far less of a system of, of public footpaths outside of national parks and things. So Anne Bevan in Orkney, um, she just wrote a message to me that said, of course, there's the problem of coastal paths and coastal erosion due to an increase in storminess that we're experiencing here in, in Orkney. And of course, that's, that's uh, one of the problems of, of any, any public footpaths in, in, in any national park or, or outdoor area that, that gets a high, high volume of traffic, increased erosion and, and the damage um, that that causes. Um, don't know if that's anything you want to comment on or you've seen, seen a lot of, uh, of footpath erosion. I guess you're often off the footpath anyway. I guess... Um... I can't honestly say that I've seen a lot of erosion um, 
of the paths I've been on around islands. Um, the, the biggest sort of, uh, uh, the most eroded paths I've seen are my, the mountains in the UK. And, um, you know, obviously conservation charities and local organisations have taken steps to to ensure, to minimise the, the impacts of that through various strategies. Um, I think because um, certainly in Orkney, um, there aren't many official coastal paths, um, but if there were coastal paths, then, and it brought in, you know, it had a significant impact on the economy through bringing walkers, then I think the, the erosion of those paths can be managed. Uh, Hannah Maksinkowski says, thank you for the inspiration, Lisa. I feel like islandering around the North Sea coast now. Any recommendations on starting such a tour? On the North Sea coast? Maybe an easy entry island. An easy entry? Well, I guess, um, oh gosh. The islands of, um, in North Essex, are, that's on the North Sea. So that's, that's, they, they are good starting points, but, but actually in Orkney, um, so that's on the North Sea route. Uh, you know, they are just the most, it's my favorite archipelago. So um, I would definitely, definitely go and spend time up there because actually if you base yourself in Kirkwall, the transport to all the islands, the inter-island transport is an absolute delight. Fantastic. So you do have a favourite. We, we, we got one out of you. I know uh, if I'm not careful, I'm going to receive complaints because this conference has been so biased towards Orkney. By far uh, more speakers from Orkney than anywhere else. I keep complimenting, complimenting Orkney. So hopefully a lot of the people attending will be making a, a trip up there. But yeah, really, really a fantastic place. And I actually just mentioned in, in the chat, interesting that they they have, uh, I think there's, a, there's around 20 inhabited islands plus other um, uninhabited islands as well and the transportation between the archipelago is really interesting um, when I went to North Ronald say from Kirkwall I took uh, a small plane about a, a, a 10 seater plane something like that uh, that went over but Orkney is actually in the process of electrifying um, all of its small planes that do the island hopping routes they really act as, as buses so um, I think the plan is within the next three or four years they'll be electrifying um, that route and then also they're looking at the ferries there's a couple of the ferry routes if you'd have joined the the session um on orkney yesterday um they talked about the hydrogen ferries that's powering them with the excess of renewable energy that they have so quite interesting from from those front fronts um as well patricia says did you do any journeys around the isle of sky i think she's from the isle of sky that's why she's asking um, well, Isle of Skye is my, I spend all winters up there, so I have a home up there. Um, so actually, I only know of one person that's actually walked the whole um, Isle of Skye around the outside edge. So there aren't any footpaths. So it is, um, it's kind of typical, you'll know this, what I mean, but typical Isle of Skye walking. Um, so it's possible. Um, I haven't done it. It's on my list. Um, I have largely focused on the book on one day trips that I can do in one day, but the next phase of the project will be multi-day trips. So I'm really looking forward to that because I can actually do that one from my doorstep. How many days do you think the Isle of Skye would need? Uh, probably, probably two weeks. Of, uh, it, I mean, I, the okay. train is rough um, and it's, uh, the West Coast is highly indented. So, um, yeah, it's always interesting when you have those sort of coastlines that takes takes a lot longer than you think. But there is the Sky Trail, um, which is amazing. That but but that goes from north to south, and parts of it are on the coast. But it's a really real wilderness experience, and that's that's another example of where landowners have worked together to create a long distance trail. Patricia just says uh, kayaking is the best route. Do you do you do a lot of kayaking? I do, but. Uh, I, yes, I do kayak out to Ireland, but I'm, I'm tending to kayak out to Ireland if there's no other means of transport. Um, I live on Loch Brackadale, so um, near Fiskerbeg, so the, the sea there is always flat, but, um, you know, going around East Point and some of the northern, the northern tip would be quite interesting in certain conditions, so I'd be really interested if, if you've done any kayaking there. Yeah, I can put you in touch after the after the call if you send me an email, Patricia. 
Um, okay, so we're almost out of time. Just one quick last question for you. We talked a bit about the privatization of islands, and I'm guessing when you say that, you're tending to refer to kind of small individual islands that, um, that don't have a local population. But of course, one big issue in Scotland has been uh, land ownership. And uh, I forget the exact, exact statistics, but it's uh, surprisingly a very small number of people own the majority of, of Scotland's land. And so there's been a growing tendency, which I think is fantastic. Um, Egg, um, E-I-G-G, the Isle of Egg being one of the first to uh, have a community buyout. And um, I think Olva and others, I'm sure other people know others, if you want to drop those names in the chat as well, um, that have been, have been buying, out, uh, buying out the land. Um, have you have you seen have any of the islands that you've been to been um, kind of still under that system of of landlord ownership, and or have you seen many of the ones that have been community owned, and, and any differences there? And have you been to Egg? Yes, I have been, um, and was lucky enough to speak to some of the people that um, were sort of instrumental in um, sort of in development that as a community owned island. Um, I think. In Egg, it's a, it's a great example of community ownership. Um, other, I mean, there's a, Ulva is, is still really, really new. Um, so I think it's only in the last couple of years. Um, I did meet the previous um, landowner um, because, yeah, I was just going back on the ferry. Um, I think actually if all stakeholders uh, on the island are completely signed up to the future of that island, then it works incredibly well and is the way forward. Um, but maybe in places where it hasn't worked so well, it's usually an example of where stakeholder engagement and communication has just fallen down. And there's a big difference between the aspirations of the newer generation compared to some of the older generations and traditions. Fantastic. Um, Francis Byers just added, please feel free to come to Bruni Island and see the sea, qu sea cliffs, the penguins and our seal colony. Um, that's just off the eastern coast of Tasmania and you don't get don't get many penguins in Scotland so that might be an, a, a welcome change for for sea life. Um, Lisa thank you so much any any last uh, final final words before we finish? Uh, no just just to say thanks James I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed um, the the presentations that I've seen so far and I look forward to listening into the, to the rest of the speakers and thanks for, for the opportunity. Yeah, well, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you've had a busy travel schedule, so I really appreciate you being able to to join us today. Um, to everyone, um, oh, my computer's just trying to restart. Um, to everyone joining us, uh, thank you so much. Uh, don't forget, all the sessions are available on record. You can go to the Facebook Live post, uh, to the Facebook Live page, um, Island Innovation, to see them all immediately. Um, but they'll also all be available through the same link that you use to join here. Um, but it takes anything from three to six hours to, to access that link. And a final reminder, um, Lisa's fantastic book is available in the giveaway along with six other books. Um, there's maybe a slight British bias to all of those books, but there are ones about um, Jamaica and, um, and, and beyond as well. So islandinnovation.co slash giveaway to enter that competition um so that's it i'm uh, having a break for a couple of hours before we have another session but we'll see some of you later on today and uh look forward to those sessions so thank you everyone and thank you lisa bye